Hello everyone, welcome to tutorial number 12 in our R tutorial series. Today we're going to be talking about repeated measures ANOVA and mixed design ANOVA and how you do these analyses in R. I'm looking forward to this tutorial in particular because I think it's going to be relevant to a lot of you since these sorts of analyses are commonly used in clinical trials. We have a lot to cover today so let's just jump right into it. Um, as always, first download our R code and data sets if you haven't already done so from our GitHub. Second change the directory to the location um, on your computer where you save those files. And finally, as I've said previously, I want to focus each new tutorial on the new content code and functions, um, which means that I'm going to go quickly over code and functions and content that we've reviewed in detail in prior tutorials. So if you do find yourself getting a little lost, I recommend that you look at our previous tutorials to figure out what we're doing. So let's uh, let's load the packages that we're going to be using today. Disable scientific notation and set our directory. And we're going to be talking first about our new data set, which I'm calling the psychotherapy trial. And this is, of course, again, fake data. It's simulated data for the purposes of teaching. But the reason why we have a new data set um, is because the previous data set, the alcohol and self-control study, is what is called an independent design or between subjects design, meaning that each observation or sorry, that each uh, participant has one observation and um, and therefore comparisons across levels of any particular factor or comparisons between subjects. Repeated measures data has a completely different um, different type of data and it yeah, it's it, the reason why is because of the fact that um, in a repeated measures data, the outcome variable is measured multiple times within each subject. And this repeated measurement of the outcome variable is represented by different levels of a predictor. So that's gonna make sense in a moment with this, with this example here. Um, so we have this randomized control trial of 134 patients in total, and there's 67 patients in each intervention group, and we have a control group and an active treatment group. Specifically, it's an RCT testing the efficacy of outpatient psychotherapy versus weightless control to improve psychosocial functioning, which these researchers defined as you know, a person's capacity for work, love, and play. And the patients are all adult patients who've had chronic long-standing depression. And uh, the outcome measure is this psychosocial functioning um, variable, and it's a scale of 0 to 100 points, and higher scores indicate better functioning. Now, the crucial part about this uh, trial, which makes it a repeated measures design, is that this outcome measure was measured multiple times within each subject. Specifically, it was measured at baseline, so pre-treatment, one month after the start of treatment, six months after the start of treatment, and 12 months after the start of treatment. So this is a 12-month clinical trial. So our outcome measure is actually a repeated measure, and we need to um, represent that repeated measurement uh, by different levels of a predictor. So we have two predictors in this clinical trial, intervention, which is a between-subject predictor, and we have two levels, waitlist versus psychotherapy, and that, and we're and we are representing the repeated measurement of the outcome measure with this variable, which I'm calling time, and the different levels of this predictor are, reflect the different um, repeated measurements. So pre-treatment or baseline scores, one month after the start of treatment, six months after the start of treatment, and 12 months after the start of treatment. So this uh, is repeated measures data, and for reasons that we describe in our our lectures on the repeated measures ANOVA, repeated measures data is fundamentally different from independent or between subjects data, which means that you need to use different tests. In other words, you can't use the same kinds of uh, tests that we've been talking about thus far in our um, our tutorial series, such as a you know a linear regression or independent ANOVA, be, to analyze repeated measures data, and you need special tests. And these are the ones that we're going to be, um, or at least some of the ones we're going to be reviewing today in this tutorial. And notice that this design is not simply just a repeated measures design, but is technically a mixed design because we have 
One predictor is a between subjects predictor, and then we have another predictor um, which is reflecting the repeated measurement of our outcome measure. So this is what I mean by a mixed design in that it has both repeated or within subject factors and between subject or independent factors. So let's load this data set. It's an Excel file. I'm going to put it into a data frame called DAT. And let's look at the first 20 rows just to get a sense of what this data looks like. So on our first column, we have our participant ID. Second column is the between subjects predictor, so the intervention group. And the third column is our um, within subjects predictor, um, reflecting time. And it's these are characters, so T0, T1, T6, and T12. But we're only showing the first 20 rows, so you can't see all of that. And then we have the psychosocial functioning scores at each level of um, the predictors. Um, and then we have a, a numeric version of our time variable. And you'll see why I wanted a numeric version of it. In brief, the reason why it's going to be helpful for our plot, which we're going to make soon. But the numeric version of time is the exact same. So T0 is coded as a 0, T1 is 1, T6 is 6, and T12 is 12. Now, this data structure is actually in what's called long format, meaning that each row reflects one observation, not one participant, which would be wide format. And the reason why it's in long format is because the package that we're going to be doing, the repeated measures ANOVA and the mixed design ANOVA requires that the data be in long format. And I personally prefer long format for repeated measures data. So because we're doing an ANOVA, we need to factor our two predictors. So we're going to factor the first predictor, our between subjects predictor, the intervention. So it has two levels, waitlist and psychotherapy. And we're going to make the reference category the waitlist group. And then similarly for our within subject predictor, we are going to uh, factor it as well and make the reference category time zero. And then we're going to use the attributes function for each to take a look at the order of the categories and, the re and confirm that the reference category is correct. So for the intervention group, the reference category is as we've set it since this is the first um, level listed and it's a factored variable now. And then similarly for time, this is the order of the variables. So T0, 1, and 6, and 12. And the first uh, level is our reference category. Reference category. So that's that's good. So now moving on to part two, we want to get some descriptive statistics of our data set um, and then make a preliminary plot in preparation for our ANOVAs. So first of all, we need to check whether or not our data is balanced. And the reason why balanced data matters, particularly for repeated measures ANOVA, is detailed in our lecture on um, repeated measures ANOVA. But what we see here is that there's equal sample sizes at each level of each predictor. So there's 67 participants in each arm of this clinical trial. And of course, they are uh, there's equal sample sizes in at each level of each predictor. Is there any missing values? Let's run that line of code. No, there's not. So this is good. So we have nicely, we have a nice balanced data and we have no missing values. So for this next part, I'm just getting some descriptive statistics in preparation for this plot, as well as just to get a general sense of the overall mean of the different groups. So, you know, to begin, I'm not the most uh, elegant or certainly not the most skilled computer programmer. I wouldn't even call myself a computer programmer for that matter. Um, so there's definitely a more efficient way of doing what I'm doing here. But this makes sense to me and this is why I, I do it this way. So, um, yeah, it just makes sense to me. So I'm showing you how I'm doing it. So what I'm doing is using the subset function, which we have reviewed in detail um, early in this R tutorial series. And what I've defined, I've defined eight variables. WL stands for waitlist, Psi stands for the psychotherapy group, and then we have each of the time points. And I'm basically using the subset function to pick out um, the psychosocial functioning variables for each of the groups at each time point. So what this uh, this part of the uh, subset function is doing, it's a logical statement saying, if uh, the particular observation is a waitlist participant and it's time zero, then get the psychosocial functioning score for that person. Similarly, if it's a waitlist person and it's um, 
time one, get that psychosocial functioning score, et cetera, for both all of the weight, for everyone in the wait list and everyone in the psychotherapy group and at each time point. And that is just getting us a bunch of different vectors, which we're then going to put in a data frame called dat underscore descriptives, which has all of the, um, which basically just broke apart our main data frame dat into separate columns representing the different time points for the different groups. And there's 67 rows because there's 67 participants in each arm of the clinical trial. And what we're going to do now is just get the descriptive statistics of these columns. So we have a the descript the sorry the describe function within this other function, which is going to force the results to be a data frame. So what this is doing is it's redefining DAT descriptives as the descriptive statistics of these columns. And then we'll be able to get those descriptive statistics or look at them, I mean. So let's open this up so we can see them. So let's rerun DAT underscore descriptives. And there you go. So we have a nice little um, table summarizing all of the descriptive statistics for each group and each time point. So here for the waitlist group, we have the mean, standard deviation, median, et cetera. And you can see that for the waitlist group at baseline or pretreatment, their psychosocial functioning scores were about 46 and a half on this zero to 100 point scale. And it looks like over time from uh, baseline until 12 months at the end of the clinical trial, their, their psychosocial functioning scores actually declined a little bit, but we don't know if that's statistically significant. Similarly, or not similarly, the opposite um, for the psychotherapy group, they also started at a very similar baseline to the waitlist group, but their scores actually tended to go up. But we don't know if those are if that's a statistically significant trend, which is why we need to do um, our repeated measures ANOVA and our mixed design ANOVA to basically answer that question. And before we actually make our make our plot, because I need certain values in this descriptive or this dat underscore descriptives data frame, um, I'm going to just may add three new columns. So I'm going to add a time column, a time number column, so a numeric version of it, and then just coding the intervention group because I'm going to need some of those columns for our plot since we're going to be plotting two different data frames. So for the time column, we're basically just using the repetition function. So we're going to repeat this, this vector twice because, of course, if you just look at the data frame, it's actually repeated twice, 0, 1, 6, 12, and it's repeated twice. Similarly for the numeric version of that. And then for the actual groupings, we are going to repeat waitlist four times because the first four columns, or the first four rows, I mean, are the waitlist group, and the last four rows are the psychotherapy group. So we're just adding these two little columns so that we can use some of them in our plot. So let's just look at what the what it looks like. Let me expand that out. It's getting quite long now. So there you go. So we just added these three columns. That's all. So let's now make our preliminary plot, as you should always do before you do data analysis. you got to look at your data. So we're using the ggplot function. We're very familiar now by this by tutorial number 12 in this tutorial series of, of the basics of the ggplot. So notice we're not defining the main data frame, or sorry, we're not defining the data frame or x and y axis in the main function of the ggplot because we want to use different data frames at different layers of this plot because we're making a, a somewhat more complex plot. So we're very familiar with all of this code. So we're setting the x and y limits. We're setting the tick marks for the, uh, for the y, axis and for the x-axis the only new thing is this we're making minor breaks as null because I just want breaks in um, for these four values of the x-axis we're setting the the x and y axis labels and we're putting the legend at the bottom and then the first layer of data that we're plotting is this geom jitter function which we've seen before and we're plotting the individual participant psychosocial functioning scores they're going to be circles they're going to be kind of small circles so size one and we're introducing a little bit of a random spread so we can see these circles a bit better so they're not all overlapping and we are making them somewhat transparent 
because there's going to be a lot of circles and uh, the transparency just makes it a little bit less uh, overwhelming on the eye. So the, we're setting the alpha parameter and then we're saying that the X um, axis is going to be time number and the Y axis is psychosocial functioning scores and they're going to be colored according to the intervention group. So let's plot everything up until that layer. So here you go. We have our, our clouds of, of dots of individual participant psychosocial functioning scores. And the blue dots are the psychotherapy group and the red dots are the weightless control group. And what you can see is there's obviously a lot of overlap, but especially by six months and 12 months, you start to see a separation of these two groups overall in terms of the the clouds, so to speak, of um, of observations. One thing I want to point out is is uh, why I used time number rather than the actual categorical time variable. The reason why is because by using the time number on the x-axis, you can actually um, it's it, it, the x-axis is now going to be scaled in a way that is true to the actual differences in the time period. If I was to just use the categorical value, these would actually just be equally spaced, so 0, 1, 6, and 12, which is actually kind of a deceptive or not entirely accurate way to describe our x-axis because the, dif the difference between baseline and one month is a much smaller period of time compared to one month and six months and six months to 12 months. So by using the numeric value of time, we're able to actually convey this difference um, in the x-axis. So that's just an FYI to you guys. And then for the uh, second part, we actually want to plot the group means for each of the intervention groups on top of these on top of the scatter plot. So we're going to use our data descriptives data frame, which we've defined. We're going to make much larger dots and there's not going to be a, a transparency for them. So they're going to be solid. And we're using a little bit of a dodge because we don't want the dots <clears throat> to overlap. And again, the X axis is going to be their, our time variable, but the numeric version of it for the reasons I just described. The X, the Y axis is going to be the average psychosocial functioning scores, which is the column called mean. And then where they're going to be grouped according to, or colored, I mean, according to the intervention group. So let's run that. So there you go. We got our, our group means, and that kind of confirms what we just said before, that it seems like these, these uh, distributions of um, patient psychosocial functioning scores start to separate out in later periods of the treatment or of the clinical trial. And then finally, what I'd like to do is attach lines uh, for each of these different intervention groups. So we're going to use the GEOM line, which I don't believe we've reviewed yet in detail, but it has a very similar form to all of the other GEOMs that we've reviewed so, so far. So we're defining the data frame, which is going to be, again, our DAT descriptive, since we want to connect lines to the actual means. We're going to use some narrow lines, size 1. The x-axis is going to be our numeric um, version of time, y-axis is uh, the mean, so that's going to connect them to the means, and then they're going to be grouped according to the, the intervention, or colored according to the intervention. And there you go. So we have our group level effect of, um, set of, of the intervention uh, over time, and we don't know, though, whether these differences we're seeing between the two uh, intervention groups are statistically significant. So let's dive into our data analysis to sort that out. So moving on to part three. So we're going to start with a one-way repeated measures ANOVA. Technically, as I've said, this is a mixed design data because we have a between subject and a within subject um, predictor. But for the sake of teaching, I just want to ignore the intervention group and just focus on the psychotherapy arm of the clinical trial to show you how you do what's called a one-way repeated measures ANOVA. It's one way because we just have one within subject factor, which is going to be time. So we're going to subset our entire data frame and just pick out all those patients who are in the psychotherapy arm using the subset function. And then, of course, getting their numbers. There's going to be 67 participants because we already know that there's 67 participants in each arm of the trial. And how do you actually specify repeated measures ANOVA using the function we're going to be looking at today, which is the AOV4 function, which we've already, we're already pretty familiar with it in terms of an independent ANOVA, but there's a subtle difference when you want to do, when you want to incorporate, I mean, a repeated measures predictor. So, you know, there's different, just going to say 
Full disclosure, there's different functions you can use in R to do um, a repeated measures ANOVA or mixed, des mixed design ANOVA, but I personally find the AOV4 function within the AFEX package um, one of the better, if not, yeah, one of the better functions because of the fact that it, it's just so versatile and produces a lot of really helpful information and I think is pretty user-friendly. So for that reason, I use it personally and I'm teaching you um, how to use it today. So the data needs to be in long format, which I've said, and the general form of the, uh, of the code is similar to the ones we've seen when we looked at the independent ANOVAs, but there's a key difference, which will be clear soon. So first of all, outcome, by outcome, I mean the dependent variable factor A is our within subject factor. So in our study, that would be time. In factor B is our between subject factor. So in our study, that would be intervention. And then we have a column for the participant IDs. So as we've already um, reviewed for the independent ANOVA, the first part of the AOV4 function is the formula. Then you define your type, your type of sums and squares, which uh, generally speaking, for reasons I already, I already explained in the factorial ANOVA tutorial, type three sums and squares is a reasonable default option. And um, the data set will be whatever data set you're analyzing. So the key difference is really this error term. So remember in the independent ANOVA, the error term was a one with the vertical line and then the participant ID column. So when, you're, when you have a repeated measure, what you actually need to do is put the repeated measure, so RM predictor, within the error term on the left side of the vertical line. And then you obviously have your participant ID on the right side of the vertical line. And then you define your formula as we've been doing over the, really the last number of tutorials where you have your outcome, squiggly line, and then your predictors. So in this, uh, this example here, we're basically using the asterisk function, which will automatically define the lower order main effects of each of these factors, as well as their higher order interaction. So the key take home is, if you wanna do a repeated measures ANOVA, you have to stick the repeated measures factor within the error term. So in this case, we would actually just type A there. And that's how you would actually incorporate the repeated measures within this um, function. So I'm just gonna undo that. So let's go to our one-way independent ANOVA. So we're using the AOV4 function, our outcome variable, psychosocial functioning, squiggly line, so meaning predicted by time. And because time is a repeated measure, we put it in the error term. We're using type three sums of squares. And uh, that's our data frame, just the, the dat underscore size, since we've subsetted the data just to ignore um, the between subject factor and focus only on the patients uh, who are in the psychotherapy arm of the trial. So all of the data we're going to talk about in part three is just the patients in the psychotherapy arm. So let's run that model. And then let's get the output. I'm just going to open this up because it's a big output and a little intimidating. Um, so that's kind of scary looking, but let me chunk it for you. So we're going to talk about that chunk, we're going to talk about that chunk, and we're going to talk about this chunk. So what is the first chunk? So this is our very familiar uh, ANOVA table. Assuming sphericity. Okay, I'm going to just direct you to our lecture on repeated measures ANOVA where we describe what sphericity is and why it's important in a repeated when you have a repeated measures. Um, so I, there's, we don't need to get into the details here and I think it'll just be more confusing. But the point is that in repeated measures ANOVA, you assume sphericity and you need to test if that assumption is true. And if it's not true, then you have to correct something, which will be clear in a second if you don't already know. So this is our standard ANOVA table, very familiar. We've got our sums of squares, the intercept, their predictor time. We have the degrees of freedom of the numerator, which is the model. We have the um, degrees of freedom of the denominator, which is the residual. We have the sums of squares of the residuals, and we have the F test. And this F test for time is very statistically significant. Um, and we're not assuming sphericity, and you know that because these degrees of freedom are whole numbers. Whereas if you have to correct for violations of sphericity, these will be decimal places, which will be clear shortly. So we have this statistically significant F test, but because it's a repeated measures, we really need to test for whether this assumption of sphericity is true. And the way you test that, a common test is the Mochley's test for sphericity. Basically, if it's statistically significant, then sphericity is violated. 
uh, in which case you actually need to correct your degrees of freedom for sphericity. And the way you do that is using what's the, the, the two main ones are the greenhouse geyser correction. And I'm going to mispronounce this because I always do the Hoonfeld uh, correction. And there are two different ways of estimating sphericity. And then you take that estimate and then you modify the degrees of freedom to incorporate the violation of sphericity into your um, calculation of the p-value. So for the greenhouse geyser, which is the first one listed, it generates an estimate of uh, sphericity, which is um, called epsilon, so EPS for short, and that's the value. And what's really nice about AOV4 function, it actually just tells you automatically that even if you um, correct for sphericity, the F test is still statistically significant with the greenhouse geyser correction. So that's kind of helpful. But we don't actually know how the degrees of freedom have changed, which is why we need uh, another line of code, which I'm going to show you shortly. Similarly, for the Hoonfeld um, correction, you have this estimate, and uh, it also tells you that the F test still remains statistically significant despite um, correcting for sphericity using the greenhouse or using the Hoonfeld um, estimate of sphericity. So uh, that's good. That's reassuring. So we, we still have a statistically significant F test, but we need to know what the degrees of freedom is. So I have this other line of code here and it, in the AFEX package, it's literally called the nice function, which is kind of hilarious if you ask me. So um, the first argument is the, a, the AOV4 model. Then I set intercept to true because I like to get that information, but you don't have to. And then you define the correction. So you can change these options by removing the comment and uh, commenting off the option that you didn't want. So we're just going to use the greenhouse geyser since it's the default. And you can also, if you are so inclined, to get no correction. So let's get this uh, ANOVA table with the corrected degrees of freedom. So it's the same ANOVA table. All the information is the same, including the F-test. Uh, but the difference is, is that the degrees of freedom of the predictor are different. Notice that they're now decimal places. So up here, in the when you assume sphericity, the degrees of freedom of the numerator was 3 and the denominator was 198. Here, it's 2.5 and 164.83. How did it get those numbers? Well, very simple. Basically, when you, when you correct for sphericity, you take the estimate of epsilon, in this case, the greenhouse geyser of epsilon, um, estimate, which is 0.832, and then you multiply it by 3, which is that, which is 2.5, and then similarly, you multiply, one. what is it, 198? Yeah, 198, and then you get 164.8. It's just rounded, so that's why it says that. So, uh, and those, and you would report those in your, um, in your manuscript, which is why I wanted to show you how you actually get the corrected degrees of freedom. Um, yeah, so there we go. So we have this significant F test, but what does that mean? So what it means is that there is something driving, um, sorry, what the F test means is that we can't assume that all of the means across different levels of time are the same. It, in other words, that the average psychosocial functioning score is different at different levels of the factor time, but we don't know which one or ones are different. So the first thing we should do, as always, is plot your data. So we're going to use the uh, EM means package, which, as I've said before, is extremely useful. And, uh, and therefore, we use it a lot, or at least I use it a lot. And we're going to use that EMIP function, which is the interaction plot. But you can plot main effects, which is what we're doing here, just like we've done in the independent ANOVA. So I'm not going to review that. We're going to get the 95% confidence intervals. And again, this is just the psychotherapy patients. And what you see is kind of a clear, you know, kind of explains why the F test was significant because, you know, overall it looks like people in the psychotherapy arm of the clinical trial tend to get better, meaning their scores on, the, on psychosocial functioning, you know, the trend is that they get better. One thing I should mention when you're looking at um, confidence intervals within subjects, uh, you can't actually rely on the overlap to judge whether or not a confidence interval or whether or not a group difference is significantly different, um, whereas you can do that with, when the observations are independent. So we actually can't tell just looking at the confidence intervals whether, for instance, T0 and T1 are the same or different, similarly for T1 and T6. Although, given the difference between T0 and T12, it's almost certain that these are statistically um, different from each other.
but let's actually do some postdoc testing to sort that out. So um, first of all, I have a little bit of a, I have a little message here, which I've already sort of said before or, or flagged for you in the independent ANOVA tutorial about the AFEX package and the type of model. So remember when we're doing our postdoc testing and pairwise comparisons, you have to define the model. So the default is to use, the default that EM means uses is a univariate model, but when there's violations of sphericity in a repeated measures design, it's actually more appropriate to use a multivariate model because in short, um, it's uh, less liberal or a more conservative uh, estimate, so to speak, and um, uh, particularly in the context of violations of sphericity. That's all you need to know. If you really wanna read about it, you can look at the AFEX package, page 30, and I've provided the link for their PDF. But it's an important thing to know that you actually have to set this to multivariate, whereas in the independent ANOVAs, it was set to univariate. So we're going to use this now very familiar um, EM means function where we're going to get the pairwise comparisons just looking at the main effect of time. We're using a multivariate model and we of course need to adjust the p-values for multiple comparisons and then it's going to put information within this variable called post hocs and we have two objects within post hocs, the estimated marginal means and the, and the post hoc t-tests. So let's just get all of that since we're very, since it's the same code we've reviewed in prior tutorials. So the first part here is the estimated marginal means, which just are the means that we've seen before for the psychotherapy group at each time point, and also the upper and lower confidence intervals. Now these are our post hoc t-tests. So let's just look at our graph because it's always nice to look at the post hoc t-tests while also looking at the graph. So we see that it's done pairwise comparisons comparing every group with every other group. So starting with T0 to T1, there's a um, difference of 2.49, and that's statistically significant. So T0 to T1 is a 2.49 difference. Just ignore the sign. What's actually more important in the post hoc t-test is the absolute values because it's just the, the difference of means. It just it, The sign is either positive or negative depending on whether T0 or T1 was set as, you know, the the uh, reference category, so to speak, or the, the or the reference group, which was where where the other group was subtracted from. So it doesn't actually really matter the sign. What matters is the absolute value. So there's a 2.5 difference in psychosocial functioning scores between T0 and T1, which is statistically significant. Um, which again, despite the overlap in the confidence intervals, and similarly for T0 and T6, there's a statistically significant difference. T0 and T12. Uh, T1 and T6, these are different, and T1 and T12 are different, and really the only non-significant difference is T6 to T12, meaning that it looks like patients in the psychotherapy arm of the clinical trial kind of plateaued in terms of their um, improvement in psychosocial functioning in the later phase of treatment. So there was some rapid improvement in the early phase, but then they sort of level off in the later phase. And hence, it was not statistically significant. So now we want to make sure um, whether or not parametric test assumptions hold true for our repeated measures ANOVA, which is a, a kind of parametric test. So because we're using the AOV4 function, we need to use this you know, somewhat convoluted way of getting the residuals and predicted values. And it's a bit more convoluted compared to when you use an LM object, but we can't actually use an LM object when analyzing repeated measures data. The reason why is detailed in our lecture on repeated measures ANOVA, but in brief, there's a repeated measures data uh, violates a very important assumption underlying linear models called the independence of residuals. And as a result of that, you basically need totally different types of analyses to analyze repeated measures data. So we can't actually use the LM model anyway, even if we wanted to. So we're gonna use this way of extracting the residuals and we're just gonna show the first 20 observations. And you can see all of the fitted values and residuals line up with the observed values, but it's particularly important to use this particular way to extract the residuals and fitted values and attach them to your data frame. Because notice that for whatever reason, uh, the AOV4 function actually reorganizes the rows. So you have the first four rows are, the, are for this particular participant, but it kind of reorganized the, the T0, T1, T12, and T6 rows. So T12 is before the T6. And that just is, you know, the reason why you actually need to use this particular, uh, this particular way so that all of these values line up 
Um, that's all, but it doesn't actually change ultimately the, the, the nature of the underlying data analysis. So let's plot those residuals from our new data frames it's called new dat and take a look at them. So, you know, looking at this histogram, it's not, you know, it's not super nice, uh, so to speak, in terms of a normal distribution. It's kind of bell shaped. It's sort of symmetrical, but not really, I'll admit. So, you know, we need to do some more testing to figure out whether or not our residuals are normally distributed. I'd say this is approximately normal, but not, not, uh, not, it's not that great. So unfortunately at present, as I write out here, someone needs to develop some code so you can run the same auto plot function, which we've shown in the independent ANOVAs tutorials, which is a really nice um, uh, function to get some diagnostic plots. Uh, you just basically, if you try to run that for an AOV4 model with the repeated measures, you get an error term, which is what we get here. Similarly, there's actually a built-in um, diagnostic plot function. If you just use the, the plot function, of with, which is a built-in function in R, and just try to plot the, the model, you also get an error term, which just says it's not able to do so. So someone needs to do some work. Someone smarter than me and better at programming than me needs to develop some code so we can use the auto plot function. Um, but thankfully, there is another package which you've downloaded called GG Resid Panel. And there's a function within it called the residual, I'm going to call this auxiliary panel, which allows you to manually plug in the residuals and predicted values to get some of the same plots that the auto plot function um, calculates, except the scale location plot and the Cook's distance plot. But if you are so inclined, you can actually manually plot these if you wanted to, because you have actually all the data to calculate and plot them. I just haven't done so, but if you're so inclined, you know, uh, have fun. So let's plot this, uh, this the diagnostics of our model. So we're plugging the residuals with our new data frame residuals. The predicted values are the fitted values. Smoother equals true. So a smoother is just a fitted function, which is going to fit to the um, residual plot. And just to help see whether there's patterns in the data, specifically whether there's linearity or not in the residuals. And then we have our QQ bands, which uh, uh, are the 95% confidence intervals around the QQ plot. And then we have bins for our histogram, and we're going to plot a residual plot, the QQ plot, what's called an index plot, which I'll show you in a second, and then a histogram. So let's run that. Okay, so it's, you know, it's a nice plot, definitely. It just doesn't have the scale location in the Cook's distance plot, which I like in the auto plot function. So, you know, the residual plot uh, looks good. Um, so definitely linearity that assumption holds true. Uh, homogeneity of variance, I would say, also pretty much holds true. Uh, so all of that's quite reassuring. The QQ plot, uh, you know, it's all of the um, residuals seem to lie mainly on the line of the theoretical quantiles of the normal distribution. And certainly most of them are within the 95% confidence interval, which is the shaded line. But this is kind of what's called a negative kurtosis pattern. So there's a little bit of that in the data, which probably explains the histogram we just saw. An index plot is kind of like a residual plot. I don't use it that often. Basically plots the observation number. So remember, there's 67 participants that we're considering right now times four observations. So it's kind of like a residual plot, except the x-axis doesn't have the predicted values. But it sort of shows you similar information that... The fitted line, which is the red line in both of these, is largely horizontal. And uh, homogeneity variance also holds true since the spread is equal at different levels of the x-axis. And then the, we have the histogram of the residuals, which there, you know, we used a bin of 50. So there's smaller um, number of observations within each bin. So it looks slightly different, but it's the same data. And then this function, the resid auxiliary panel actually fits a normal distribution um, curve to the to the histogram to get a sense of to what extent the residuals are normally distributed. So you know I think the take home of these diagnostics is that overall it's a the certainly linearity holds true and homogeneity of variance, but normality of the residuals is I would say approximately normal. So given that ambiguity, it would be helpful to look at uh, some quantitative metrics. So here we have the 
descriptive statistics of the residuals and you know there's negative kurtosis here um, and so that kind of explains the QQ plot and again these tests which I really don't like but I'm going to run them anyway because they're always statistically significant generally speaking and of course they are because there's a little bit of um, negative kurtosis so overall I'd say the skew is all right so it's fair to say that the data is approximately normally distributed and give it, even though there is some negative kurtosis, kurtosis for reasons I've already explained in prior tutorials is not as big of a deal for um, parametric test assumptions as for instance skew. So finally for this part of the um, this part of the tutorial on the one-way repeated measures ANOVA, we're going to do planned contrast. So we had a whole tutorial on planned contrast, tutorial number 10. So if you haven't actually gone through tutorial number 10, you should probably go through tutorial number 10. Otherwise, this is going to be very confusing for you. So because I like you guys so much, I wanted to do contrasts again um, because, of course, contrasts are very easy to do. And by easy, I mean not easy at all. So as I've said in tutorial number 10, there, to do plan contrasts using the AOV4 function, it's a four-step process. The first is you define your model. The second is you get the estimated marginal means, but notice in the EM means function, we're no longer getting the pairwise comparisons as we did above. So we get our estimated marginal means. And we know that based off of the seven rules, that one of the rules is the fact that the maximum number of orthogonal contrasts you can have is K minus one, where K is the total number of means available to you. So in our case, we have four means because we're just looking at time. There's four levels of time. So we can make a maximum of three orthogonal contrasts. So when we want to define those contrasts, we actually need to define them in the order of the grouped mean. So the order is actually shown either by the attributes of time. So the first value should be coding for time zero. The second value should be coding for time one, the third for time six, the fourth for time 12. And I'm just showing the EM means because it shows you that it's organized in the same way. So you can use the EM means itself as a way to figure out the order that you need to define your contrast, which is what we're doing here. So here we're actually defining our contrast in this list. And the, remember the way planned contrasts work. They're a way to um, do post hoc comparisons, but uh, they are based off of your a priori hypotheses before you actually ran your experiment. So these researchers, before going into this uh, clinical trial, had um, at least three hypotheses for the psychotherapy patients. And uh, they are going to test those hypotheses now that they have a significant F-test in the one-way repeated measures ANOVA. So that's the backstory. So their first hypothesis was that there would be a difference between the baseline level of psychosocial functioning scores and the overall um, level of psychosocial functioning scores across all follow-up periods. So regardless of the follow-up period, they thought that these would be there would be a difference between baseline and uh, and follow up. And then also they thought that there would be a difference between the early follow up phase of the trial and the late follow up phase of the trial or uh, of treatment. <clears throat> and then finally, they thought within the late phase of treatment that there would be a difference between six months and 12 months. So I'm going to go through these contrasts. Um, but uh, again, you, you got to read or you got to go through tutorial number 10, where we go through the seven rules of how to define orthogonal contrasts, because otherwise this is going to not make much sense to you. So first of all, all orthogonal contrasts must sum to zero. So if you sum up all these values, they sum to zero. So that's good. Second of all, we want each of the parameter estimates, which are going to be estimated in step four to reflect the difference of means, meaning that uh, it'll actually reflect the difference between, for instance, time six and time 12. So in order to do that, the negatively weighted chunk that is being compared needs to sum to one, and the positively weighted chunk needs to sum to, sorry, the negatively weighted chunk needs to sum to negative one, and the positively weighted chunk needs to sum to positive one. So orthogonal contrasts, all of them sum to zero, in order for the parameter estimates to equal the difference of means, the negatively weighted chunk needs to sum to negative one and the positively weighted chunk needs to sum to positive one. So thankfully, that's the case for all three of these contrasts. So uh, what this first contrast is doing is comparing baseline. So that's the first value. It gets negative one to the follow-up and they get the same weight and it's one third. 
Similarly, or similarly differently <laughs> that, uh, for the next contrast, because in, in the first contrast for chunk one, we singled out a single mean, which can't be further subdivided based off of the seven rules. We know that we can no longer use that in subsequent contrast. So it's no longer used in contrast two or contrast three. But because chunk two in contrast one can be further subdivided, we can we can further um, tease apart uh, those. Um, we can further tease apart those means to, to figure out if there's any more differences. So within, uh, we're, we're going to do that in, in contrast two. So we're singling out now um, time one. So one month after the start of treatment and comparing it to time six and time 12. And then for the third contrast, because we've singled out um, time one, we can no longer use it again. So it gets a code of zero based off of the seven rules. And we're just comparing uh, time six and time, time 12. So let's run that those to actually set our contrasts. Great. And then step four, we're actually going to apply those contrasts. And we've seen this function before. So it basically says, apply these custom contrasts to the estimated marginal means. And then we're using the pipe function to get the 95% confidence intervals around the parameter estimates. So let's run that. So there you go, we have our little table, we have our three contrasts for the three rows, and all of them are statistically significant except the third contrast. So what the first contrast tells us is that if you were to take the average of time one, six, and 12 and subtract it from uh, time zero, which is 45, it's gonna be a difference of about six um, on the psychosocial functioning scores, meaning that compared to baseline, people in the psychotherapy arm of the trial at all follow-up periods, reg or regardless of the follow-up period, have a six-point increase in their um, psychosocial functioning scores, and that's a statistically significant difference between baseline and any follow-up period. For the early versus late phase, so this is comparing T1 with the average of T6 and T12, which that difference is about 5.5. There's also a statistically significant improvement in psychosocial functioning scores of about 5.5 on the psychosocial functioning um, scale. And then finally, which we already saw in our post hoc t-test, the pairwise comparisons, there is no statistically significant difference between T6 and T12, um, which basically shows that people are starting to baseline in the psychotherapy arm of, or, or baseline, people are starting to plateau in the psychotherapy arm of the clinical trial from in the within the late phase of the treatment. So that's great. That's really helpful. So let's move on now to the last section of this um, tutorial where we're actually going to be analyzing the data in the way it should be analyzed, which is a mixed design ANOVA because the data truly is actually a mixed design because we have a between subject factor, namely intervention, and our within subject factor, namely time which I was, for the purposes of teaching, I was just ignoring the intervention uh, category or the intervention predictor. But let's actually analyze this data properly. So we're gonna use the same AOV4 function and notice we're putting our repeated measures predictor within our error term and we're defining now the, um, uh, defining the, the model and it includes the asterisk because we wanna get the lower order main effects of time and intervention separately, as well as their higher order interaction. And we're gonna use type three sums of squares and we're using the full data set, the DAP. So let's open this up. And it's gonna set the contrast to orthogonal, uh, or set orthogonal contrast because we are using type three sums of squares with multiple predictors. And for the reasons I detailed in the um, factorial ANOVA, our tutorial, you need to have orthogonal contrast. And also I explain this, or we explain this in our statistics lectures on the factorial ANOVA. So let's see the result of this uh, mixed design ANOVA. I'm gonna open it up, it's quite a large table. So again, there's three sections. We got our assuming sphericity ANOVA table, we got our Mochley's test, and then we have our sphericity estimates and corrections with the associated p-values. So first of all, let's just focus here. So we have all the same columns that we know, and because there's, they're not corrected for sphericity, the degrees of freedom are whole numbers and not don't have a decimal place. And notice they're all statistically significant, the main effects in the interaction. But remember from the R tutorial on factorial ANOVA, in my opinion, as well as the opinion of other people, it doesn't really make any sense to interpret 
um, main effects when there's a statistically significant interaction, especially when you're using type three sums of squares, because we know that intervention actually varies the, or I mean, the effect of intervention on psychosocial functioning scores varies as a function of time. And similarly, time, the effect of time, so to speak, varies as a function of intervention, which is just another way of saying that the interaction is true. So really, you actually only need to focus on the interaction because that's the, the, that's what the, that is what is the most important finding in this ANOVA, which is the statistically significant F test. But if we look at Mochley's test for sphericity, we can't actually validly assume that sphericity is true. So we need to correct our degrees of freedom to make a more conservative p-value um, by, the, uh, by these estimates of sphericity. And we have our greenhouse Kaiser estimates and the Hoon felt estimates. And you know, the AOV4 function uh, is very helpful because it actually just automatically tells you that the F test is still statistically significant even after correcting for greenhouse geyser. But for whatever reason, um, the AOV4 package doesn't in the summary function actually just tell you what the adjusted or corrected degrees of freedom is. So we have to use the nice function to get that. And those are the corrected degrees of freedom since we actually have to use the corrected degrees of freedom, but otherwise all the information is the same, the F test, et cetera. So you would report the corrected degrees of freedom in your, um, in your manuscript. So we have this st uh, statistically significant interaction, but again, we don't actually know what's driving that significant F test. So we have to do some postdoc testing, but before we do that, we of course need to plot our interaction because plots are really the most important thing before you do any tests. So we're going to use the EMIP function. So we're going to put our model in there. And because we're looking at the interaction, we need to include that. So we're doing that here. And we've already seen this in the factorial ANOVA. So we'll just run this code and see what the plot looks like. So kind of interesting story here. So blue is uh, the psychotherapy group. Red is the waitlist group. And we have our confidence intervals. And we already know that for the repeated measurement, you can't really rely on the overlap of the confidence intervals to um, figure out whether things are statistically um, different from each other. But for the between subject comparisons, meaning across intervention, you can. So, you know, overall, it looks like the uh, psychotherapy and waitlist groups aren't actually different um, at baseline in one month. Uh, after starting treatment, but then by six months in the late phase of treatment, there starts to you start to see this separation of um, of these two arms of the clinical trial, whereby it looks like definitely the psychotherapy group gets better, which we already know from our one-way repeated measures ANOVA. But actually, it looks like the waitlist group gets worse over time, which in some ways isn't surprising because you could see this as sort of the natural history of the disease that the natural history of chronic depression is that in the absence of treatment, which is what the wait list is, you know, the wait list is not getting any treatment of any kind. The natural history of, of chronic depression is one of worsening, uh, is one of a worsening course. So th that's kind of interesting, but we need to do some postdoc tests to really sort of sort this out. And we're also going to do some planned contrasts so I can show you how you can do planned contrasts in a um, uh, mixed design ANOVA when you have an interaction. So let's minimize this and do those starting with the pairwise comparisons. So we've already seen this, um, this function before, not going to review it, but notice the differences we're adding the interaction. So we're going to get pairwise comparisons for, well, a lot of group means. So let's run that. I need to really open it up. It's quite large. Oh my goodness. Look at that table. That is 28 t-tests. And we have our estimated marginal means. And uh, what these pairwise comparisons are doing are basically comparing all of these groups. So, I mean, this table really drives home the point that you need to correct for multiple comparisons because the risk of a false positive increases exponentially as you do more comparisons. And we're doing 28 comparisons. So um, we're using the two key method, but probably it wouldn't be unreasonable to maybe do a more conservative method like the Bonferroni. So uh, I know this is a little tedious, but I will actually go through each of the significant differences. So let's just pay attention to the p-value, um, the p-value column. And I'm going to show the graph as well, because the graph kind of is a little bit more meaningful. 
So, or at least helps us interpret these post hoc comparisons. So the first significant difference uh, these pairwise comparisons found was comparing time zero, time zero of the waitlist with time 12 of the waitlist. So this group versus this group. And it's a significant difference. And what the estimate shows is that there is a three point, three and a half point decline in people's psych psychosocial functioning scores. Remember, just ignore the sign because the sign doesn't matter as much as the absolute value since the absolute value is the group difference. The sign just depends on which one was at, which mean was subtracted from which mean. So there's a three and a half point difference and it's, we know from the graph that that's a decline in psychosocial functioning. So confirming that, it seems like the natural history of the disease of, is one of worsening function in the absence of treatment. Uh, and then for this next statistically significant comparison, it's comparing T0 and time six of the psychotherapy. So T0 of waitlist with time six of the psychotherapy. Not a particularly interesting comparison, but it is different. Similarly, for the next one, it's comparing time zero with time 12 of the psychotherapy group. So time zero of the waitlist with time 12 of the psychotherapy. Again, not that interesting. Um, the next significant effect is comparing time one with the waitlist with time 12, which sort of tells the same story of worsening um, functioning going down what's the next significant one we have uh time one of the waitlist versus time 12 again not that interesting but it is technically different uh, and then now things are kind of getting interesting so time six of the waitlist let's scroll down so time six of the waitlist versus time six of the psychotherapy that's different so that's actually kind of interesting and the next row shows time six of the waitlist with time 12 so that's also different so that's also kind of interesting Going down, what's the the next? Actually, all of these all of these are statistically significant. So let's just focus on these two. So uh, this is time twelve of the waitlist versus time six of psychotherapy, and times twelve of the waitlist versus times twelve of psychotherapy, and those are different, which is again is is kind of interesting. And the last, um, all of these statistically significant effects are just comparing the group means within the psychotherapy group, which we've already done in the repeated measures ANOVA which tells us the story of one of progressive improvement in psychosocial functioning um, in the psychotherapy arm of the clinical trial. But the very last comparison is time six versus time 12 the psychotherapy, which is not different, um, which we already know because the patients seem to plateau. Okay, so let's actually get um, our predicted values and our residuals because we need to do parametric tests of this mixed ANOVA, which is, it is a parametric test. We need to, we need to see whether the assumptions hold true. And we're just using the same function we've already used previously. We're going to plot the histogram and see what it looks like now. And look at that. It's a much nicer looking histogram compared to the one-way repeated measures ANOVA, because this is actually a, a, a mixed design um, data. So by applying a model that incorporates these, this, th that incorporates the structure of the data in the model, our residuals are a much better fit of the data and, of course, are for that reason, more normally distributed. And, uh, yeah, so you have this nice sort of bell-shaped distribution and it's symmetrical. So let's get the diagnostic plots. Again, we got to use the resid auxiliary um, panel because you can't use um, the, uh, the auto plot function for the reasons I already explained. So there you go. <clears throat> We've got our residual plot, our QQ plot, our index plot, our histogram. And, you know, looking at the red line here, this fitted smoother it shows linearity is true. Similarly, for the index plot, we got definitely homogeneity of variance. So that's really reassuring, both in the index plot. The QQ plot looks actually even better. There's still a little bit of a negative kurtosis um, uh, pattern here, but it seems to be within the 95% confidence intervals along the line of the theoretical quantiles of the normal distribution. Um, but again, kurtosis isn't that big of a deal. I, I certainly don't get my knickers in a nod over kurtosis, uh, un unless it's really severe. Um, and uh, and then we have our histogram of the residuals, and that looks even better. Um, and obviously the bins are different, so there's less values within each bin, so you get a better sense of of, of the distribution here, and it has the fitted um, uh, normal distribution line. So let's get some quantitative metrics. And again, as I've said now at least two or three times in this tutorial series that for me, uh, I don't really, you know, the numbers don't matter nearly as much as the plots 
Um, so, but in any event, let's get those numbers. So kurtosis, yeah, still a little bit of negative kurtosis. Uh, the skew, I, I think it, it, this is actually even better than the skew from the um, from the one-way repeated measures ANOVA. And let's get these other tests, that, which I really don't like because they're always statistically significant, almost always, I mean. Um, and that's not surprising. They're significantly, they're, they're significant because there's a little bit of negative kurtosis. But again, who cares about negative kurtosis, especially when it's so mild. And then finally, uh, again, because I like you guys so much and um, yeah, plan contrasts are just super fun to do. Uh, we're going to go through plan contrast with, uh, with this mixed design ANOVA. So this is the whole code we're going to go through. Again, if you haven't gone through tutorial number 10 of our R tutorial series, where we go through plan contrast in excruciating detail, um, you should watch it because um, you might find yourself getting lost right now. So there's a four step process. It's the same as above. We got to define our mixed design ANOVA, and then we're going to get um, our estimated marginal means, but we're not using the pairwise, so we're not going to get any of the pairwise comparisons. And then we need to need to define our contrast using the seven rules, which again are in our which are in tutorial number 10. So we have uh, K minus one possible orthogonal or maximum of K minus one orthogonal contrasts. So K is the total number of group means available to us, which is four levels of time times two levels of intervention. So eight minus one, which is seven. So we can make a maximum of seven contrasts. And then the order is going to be the order of the means within our EM means. So we have to define our contrast using the order. So our vectors are going to be, um, here we have, you know, the first value would code for time one for the wait list. The fifth value would code for time, sorry, did I say time one? I mean, baseline for the wait list. The, for, for the first value, the fifth value would be the baseline for the psychotherapy group. Similarly, uh, time one would be uh, the second value for the wait list. And the sixth value would be um, time one for the psychotherapy group, et cetera. And that's what we're essentially doing in all of these different seven contrasts. So, you know, this is obviously fake data, but these researchers actually had some a priori hypotheses before they ran their clinical trials. So instead of doing those 28 post hoc pairwise comparisons, which is a valid form of data analysis, you could actually just not do those and focus only on the subset of uh, t-tests that are, the, the subset of t-tests based off of your a priori hypotheses. So these researchers, uh, had seven hypotheses. So the first was that overall, regardless of the time point, that psychotherapy patients would have higher psychosocial functioning scores than the waitlist group. The second was that within the psychotherapy group, that their baseline scores would be less than any of the psychosocial functioning scores at any follow-up period. And similarly for the waitlist group, there would be some difference between the baseline scores and any follow-up period in their psychosocial functioning. And then for the last four contrasts, they're basically looking at what you might call the interaction between time and intervention. So the first contrast is looking at what's called early treatment. So PSI versus waitlist for early treatment. So the difference between functioning early in treatment, so this would be at one month, so time one. Similarly, the next hypothesis was that there would be a difference in latent treatment. So this would be either at six months or 12 months. And then the last two contrasts basically tease out the late treatment effect, whether there's a difference between um, psychotherapy and waitlist at six months and 12 months. So all of these last four contrasts are comparing the psychotherapy with the waitlist control group at different time points to kind of tease apart um, the interaction in, in, but just looking at the relevant aspects of the interaction based off of their hypotheses. So let's uh, go through them uh, for the purposes of teaching. So again, remember, orthogonal contrasts must sum to zero. And if you want the parameter estimates to equal the difference of means between the groups that are being compared, the negatively weighted cluster or or, or um, chunk needs to sum to negative one and the positively weighted chunk needs to sum to positive one. So orthogonal contrast, all of it sums to zero, which this does, right? If you add all those values up, you get zero. If you add up only the negatively weighted um, uh, weights <laughs> the, uh, or the negatively weighted chunk, you're going to get negative one. And if you sum the positively weighted chunk, you get positive one. And we've reviewed this in detail in our seven rules, but I'm just showing you that, that these two 
uh, principles are going to apply to all of the contrasts. So here, um, I'm going to just expand this. You can see the estimated mean. So the first four values, oops, let me undo that. So the first four values, we are comparing the wait list. So one, two, three, four. The first four values correspond to T0, 1, 6, and 12 of the wait list. We're comparing all of those regardless of their time point, and it's regardless of their time point because they're getting equal weight with all of the, with, with the um, psychotherapy group, again, ignoring um, differences across time because there's going to be equal weights to each time point. And that's, so that's going to be the contrast for the first hypothesis. For the second contrast, because we're not interested in the psychotherapy group, they get a value of zero, which we already know from our seven rules. So the first value gets zero, second value gets zero, third value gets zero, fourth value gets zero. And because we're just looking at within the psychotherapy arm of the trial, the first value, which is the fifth value technically, so the fifth value of um, this vector is picking out T0 of the psychotherapy um, uh, mean, it's going to get a, a, a weight of negative one, and we're comparing it with any follow-up period, so that's getting one-third, and if you were to sum all the positively weighted chunk, you get positive one, and if you sum the negatively weighted chunk, you get negative one, and if you sum all of these values, you get zero, so it's an orthogonal contrast. And then it's the same logic for the uh, weight list uh, comparison, ignoring um, the psychotherapy arm, so they get zeros. So comparing T0 with any follow-up period, and because we don't care about whether it's T1, T6, or T12, they get equal weights. And then uh, to actually tease apart the interaction for this contrast, the fourth contrast, we're just comparing the wait list um, T1 mean with the psychotherapy T1 mean. So the wait list T1 mean is the second value, which is here, and the sixth value is T1 for the psychotherapy group. And for the uh, waitlist versus psychotherapy in the late phase of treatment, we're going to get equal weights for uh, six months and 12 months for the waitlist and psychotherapy arm, respectively, and that's comparing them. And notice, I should just actually go back here to the psychotherapy versus waitlist for the early treatment. Notice, since we've actually singled out, first of all, actually, since in the these two contrasts in the psi baseline versus follow-up and the waitlist baseline versus follow-up, we singled out T0. And remember from our seven rules, if you single out um, a particular mean it, and you can no longer subdivide that chunk, then you can't include it in any further contrast, which is why all other contrasts have T0 as zero. Similarly, in this, when we were doing the early treatment comparison, we singled out T1 in both arms of the trial. So we actually can't use T1 in any further contrast based off of the seven rules. And you need, and you need to obey that rule because otherwise you won't obey the rule of orthogonality. And then also in uh, uh, the late phase here, we, well, our chunk, our, our negatively weighted chunk is comparing two means with two means because we can still decompose that chunk into smaller chunks, we can actually reuse those means again, which is what we're doing in the um, psychotherapy versus waitlist at six months of treatment, where we're comparing the waitlist six-month uh, estimated marginal mean with the psychotherapy at six-month marginal mean, and then finally the 12-month um, waitlist marginal mean with the um, psychotherapy 12-month um, marginal mean. That was that was uh, excruciating to go through, but hopefully that made sense. I walked through those contrasts. So we have these seven contrasts. Let's define them. Very good. They're orthogonal and our parameter estimates should equal the difference of means that are being compared. So let's open this up. It's just the exact same function. Sorry, let me show you the function. We're basically method contrast, which just says apply these contrasts to those means. And then we're using the pipe function to get the uh, 95 percent confidence intervals around those means so let's run that beautiful so first of all notice that we've only done seven t-tests whereas in our pairwise comparison up here we did 28 okay i think this really drives home the point why planned contrasts are very helpful um, for controlling the false positive rate so rather than 
basically going on a fishing expedition to see what is statistically different. You make your hypotheses before you run your clinical trial, and then you use planned contrast to test the relevant subset of all possible comparisons you could do. Um, and then by doing it that way, you only select seven out of a total of potentially 28 contrasts, um, and therefore you don't actually need to correct the p-values for multiple comparisons. So while planned contrasts are kind of painful to go through and define, um, it is worth the, it's worth the effort because of the fact that you are getting, you're testing hypotheses that are relevant uh, to you and the kinds of research questions you have about your, um, about your clinical trial or data in general. So the first contrast is comparing the experimental condition, so to speak, with the control condition. So the psych active treatment versus the control waitlist condition. And we see this estimate of 4.5. Two, so let me actually just show the estimated marginal mean so we can look at that. So what that basically means is that if you average all of the values of the wait list and minus them from the uh, average of all the values of the psychotherapy, there's a four point difference between them. And it's actually that the psychotherapy is higher and that's statistically significant. You know, that's not actually that important of a finding because we know that the reason why it's statistically significant is because towards the end of treatment, um, patients in the psychotherapy arm get better, whereas patients in the weightless arm get worse. Um, and we know that at baseline, the patients are the same, regardless of their group. For the second contrast, it's kind of like what we already saw in the one-way repeated measures ANOVA, that compared to baseline, at any follow-up period, people in the psychotherapy arm get better. There's about a six-point increase in their psychosocial functioning scores. And then the opposite pattern showing this deterioration of psychosocial functioning, possibly as a natural, as a result of the natural history of the disease in the waitlist group, compared to the baseline at any follow-up period, there is an overall decline. So that just basically took the baseline, so T0, and then the average of these other three means for the waitlist group, there's a um, about a one point um, decline in their psychosocial functioning scores when you take the average of those three time points which again is consistent with this sort of, you know, natural history of the disease. In the absence of treatment, people get worse with chronic depression. And then the, uh, this, um, this contrast comparing the early treatment, so this was comparing T1 versus T1 of the waitlist and psychotherapy groups, that's not statistically significant, which is again is consistent with the uh, graph that we saw above. Let me see if, I can, if we can get it. Let me just cycle back here. There you go. So that's just basically making that comparison. And then uh, for the other, con for the third, or the, I guess this would be the fourth contrast. Wait, one, two, three, four, fifth contrast. Sorry, guys. Um, for the fifth contrast, just comparing late treatment. So this is the average of the six and 12 months for the wait list in psychotherapy. So if you take the average of these two means, so these two means and these two means, if we take the difference of them, there's a nine point difference, meaning that based off of this graph, we know that the psychotherapy group has a nine point um, improvement uh, in their psychosocial functioning scores compared to uh, patients in the wait list arm in the late phase of treatment. I guess it's technically not an improvement, but it's just overall they're, they're, there's a nine point, um, uh, they, their, their psychosocial functioning scores are better by nine points uh, compared to the uh, waitlist group. It's not an improvement because we actually technically haven't compared, you know, baseline with uh, the follow-up period. So it's just a difference at um, one particular time point. In, in this case, it's the late phase of treatment. Uh, for the um, psychotherapy versus waitlist at the six months, so that's uh, sort of subdividing this late treatment effect that we saw. So at six months, there's a seven-point difference, which is what we see here on the graph between the waitlist and the psychotherapy group. And then finally, at 12 months for the waitlist versus psychotherapy group, there's a 10 point difference, which is again, what we see on the graph here. Okay, we have made it. Uh, we got through a lot of content. I hope this was helpful and I hope it was as clear as possible. Um, as always, I'm very grateful for the fact that you go through these tutorials. And at least at the time of recording this, I don't actually have, um, another tutorial coming after this, although I do plan on making more
uh, tutorials looking at different types of data analysis in R. So you're going to have to stay tuned. In the meantime, take care, and I'll see you once I uh, make a new R tutorial. Bye.